today's on the spot assignment, we're going to see just what's behind the making of movies. The director and the crew are shooting a documentary film. Let's take a closer look. Bob, uh, this word documentary, uh, what would you say is the difference between a documentary film and a, a feature movie? Well, there are a good many differences. One would be length. Generally speaking, documentaries are a good deal shorter than feature films. Also, uh, documentaries have something to say in the way of a message. They are informational films. Also, another term that's used interchangeably with documentary is the word actuality, actuality films. Bob, is this the thing you uh, hold up in front of the camera before each scene? This is a clapperboard, yes. This uh, identifies on the visual camera uh, the scene number and the take number, and also, as you heard, on the soundtrack. The editor back at the studio puts the two pieces of film together, matches where the lips of the clapper come together. There you are in sync. Before the break, you were mentioning the media putting forth the information that the power elite want. I'm not sure if I understand how does the power elite do this, and why do why do we stand for it? Why does it work so well? Okay, well, I think here we have to. I mean, there, there are really two questions here. One is this picture of the media true, and there you have to look at the evidence. I mean, I've given one example, and that shouldn't convince anybody. Uh, one has to look at a lot of evidence to see whether this is true. I think anyone who investigates it will find out uh, that the evidence to support it is simply overwhelming. In fact, it's probably one of the best supported conclusions in the social sciences. But the other question is, how does it work? I'm the, uh, I'm the media guy. Media. Would you like? I got you an International Herald Tribune. Do you want that? Anything in you know, a Western language which doesn't mean <laughs> <laughs> that. The Financial, Financial Times? Times? Absolutely. <laughs> the only paper that tells the truth. <laughs> you get the one uh, where they've been debating back and forth? Uh, NRC Hundle's Blood. Hundle's Blood. Well, this evening's uh, program is scheduled as a debate, which puzzled me all the way through. Uh, there are some problems. One problem is that no proposition has been set forth. As I understand debate, people are supposed to advocate something and oppose something. Uh, rather more sensibly, a topic has been proposed for discussion. Uh, the topic is manufacture of consent. It's somewhat unusual for a member of the government to debate with a professor in public. Uh, it hasn't happened in Holland before. I don't think it oft often happens elsewhere. Mr. Bogestein, the floor is yours. Now, we all know that the theory can never be established merely by examples. It can only be established by, some, by showing some internal inherent logic. Professor Chomsky has not done so. Professor Chomsky? He's quite right when he says you can't just pick examples. You have to do them in a rational way. That's why we compared examples. The truth is that things are not as simple as Professor Chomsky maintains. Another of Professor Chomsky's case studies concerns the treatment that Cambodia has received in the Western press. Here he goes badly off the rails. <laughs> we didn't discuss Cambodia. We compared Cambodia with East Timor, two very closely paired examples. And we gave approximately 300 pages of detail covering this uh, in political economy of human rights, including a reference to every article we could discover about Cambodia. Many Western intellectuals do not like to face the facts and balk at the conclusions that any untutored person would draw. Many people are very irritated by the fact that we exposed the extraordinary deceit over Cambodia and paired it with the simultaneous suppression of the U.S.-supported ongoing atrocities in Timor. That, people don't like that. Uh, for one thing, we were challenging the right to lie in defense of the state. For another thing, we were exposing the, act the apologetics and support for actual ongoing atrocities. That doesn't make you popular. Where did he learn about the atrocities in East Timor or in Central America? if not in the same free press which he so derides. You can find out where I learned about them by looking at my footnotes. I learned about them from human rights reports, from church reports, from refugee studies, and extensively from the Australian press. 
Uh, there was nothing from the American press because it was silenced. Chairman, this is an attempt at intellectual intimidation. These are the ways of the bully. Professor Chomsky uses the oldest debating trick on record. He erects a man of straw and proceeds to hack away at him. <laughs> Professor Chomsky calls this the manufacture of consent. I call it the creation of consensus. In Holland we call it draagvlak, which means foundation. Professor Chomsky thinks it is deceitful, but it is not. In a representative democracy, it means winning people for one's point of view. But I do not think that Professor Chomsky believes in representative democracy. I think he believes in direct democracy. With Rosa Luxemburg, he longs for the creative, spontaneous, self-correcting force of mass action. That is the vision of the anarchists. It is also a boy's dream. Uh, those who believe in democracy and freedom uh, have a serious task ahead of them. What they should be doing, in my view, is dedicating their efforts to helping the despised common people to struggle for their rights and to realize the democratic goals that constantly surface throughout history. Uh, they should be serving not power and privilege, but rather their victims. Freedom and democracy are by now not merely values to be treasured, they are quite possibly the prerequisite to survival. It's a conspiracy theory, pure and simple. It is not borne out by the facts. Um, Mr. The Chairman, uh, I have to go yes. to Amsterdam. If you'll excuse me, I'm leaving. <laughs> One thing is sure, their consent has not been manufactured tonight. There is nothing more remote from what I'm discussing or what we have been discussing than a conspiracy theory. If I give an analysis of, say, the economic system and I point out that General Motors tries to maximize profit and market share, that's not a conspiracy theory. That's an institutional analysis. It has nothing to do with conspiracies. And that's precisely the sense in which we're talking about the media. The phrase conspiracy theory is one of those that's constantly brought up. To, and I think its effect simply is to discourage institutional analysis. Do you think there's a connection somehow about what the government wants us to know and what the media tell us? It's not communism, but I think to a certain point, uh, it is sensitized. They don't always tell, I guess, John, they don't always tell the truth the way it goes, huh? Got that right. Do <laughs> you think that uh, the information you're getting from this, this paper is uh, biased in any way? Or? Oh, yeah. I think, by and large, it's, uh, it's uh, well done. Uh, you get both sides of the stories. You get the liberal and the side and the conservative side, so to speak. But I don't think you get a very balanced picture because they only have 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a, for a news item or whatever, and they're going to pick out a highlight, and every network is going to cover the same highlight, and that's all you're going to see. You get uh, what they want you to hear. You think you're biased in some way, then? Yeah. Here we go. Is it possible for the lights to get a little brighter so you can see somebody out there? Yeah, for the last uh, hour and 41 minutes, I've been whining about how the elite and how the government have been using thought control to keep radicals like yourself out of uh, the public limelight. Now, uh, you're here. I don't see any CIA men waiting to drag you off. You were in the paper. They, that's where everyone here heard you were coming from in the paper, and I'm sure they're going to publish your comments in the paper. Now, a lot of countries, you would have been shot for what you have done today. So what are you whining about? This is, we are allowing you to speak, and I don't Fine. see any thought control. First of all, I haven't been saying, I haven't said one word about my, keep, my being kept out of the limelight. The way it works here is quite different. Now, I don't think you heard what I was saying, but the way it works here is that there is a system of shaping uh, control and so on, which gives a certain perception of the world. I gave one example. I'll give you sources where you can find thousands of others. That's, and it has nothing to do with me. 
It has to do with marginalizing the public and ensuring that they don't get in the way of elites who are supposed to run things without interference. In a review of the Chomsky Reader, it was written that as he's been forced to the margins, he's become strident and rigid. Do you feel this categorization of your later writings is accurate and that you've been a victim of this sort of process you've been describing? Well, the business about being forced to the uh, other people will have to judge about the stridency. I won't talk about, I don't believe it, but anyway, that's for other people to judge. However, the matter of being forced to the margins is a matter of fact, and the fact is the opposite of what is claimed. Uh, the fact is it's much easier to gain access to even the major media now than it was 20 years ago. You've dealt in such unpopular truths and have been such a lonely figure as a consequence of that. Do you ever regret either that you took the stand you took have written the things you have written, or that they, we had listened to you earlier? Uh, I don't. I mean, there are particular things which I would do differently, because you think about things, you do them differently. But in general, I would say I do not regret it. I do mean, you like being closed. controversial? No, it's a, no, it's a nuisance. Because this mass medium pays little attention to the views of dissenters, not just Noam Chomsky, right. but, but, but most dissenters sure. do not get much of a hearing in this medium. No, in fact, that's, again, completely understandable. They wouldn't be performing their societal function if they allowed favored truths to be challenged. Now, notice that that's not true when I cross the border anywhere, so that I have easy access to the media in just about every other country in the world. There's a number of reasons for that. And one reason is I'm primarily talking about the United States, and it's much less threatening. Your view there is that the military, militarization of the American economy essentially has come about because there are not other means of controlling a, the American population. In a democratic society. I mean, it may be paradoxical, but the freer the society is, the more it's necessary to resort to uh, devices like uh, induced fear. Okay. I'll go along with that. Arguably, he is the most important intellectual alive today. And if my program can give him 500,000 people listening or three quarters of a million people listening, I'll be delighted. Okay, Professor, in your own time. Wartime planners understood that actual war aims should not be revealed. Uh, part of the reason why the media in Canada and in Belgium and so on are more open is that it just doesn't matter that much what people think. It matters very much what the politically articulate sectors of the population, those narrow minorities, think and do in the United States because of its overwhelming dominance on the world scene. But of course that's also a reason for wanting to work here. What we might call the fifth freedom, the freedom to rob, exploit, and dominate, and to curb mischief by any feasible means. Let's conclude, not include. The United States is ideologically narrower in general than other countries. Furthermore, the structure of the American media is such as to pretty much eliminate critical discussion. Our guests are as far apart on the Contra question as American intellectuals can be. Now, if we had the slightest concern with democracy, which we do not in our foreign affairs and never have, we would turn to countries where we have influence, like El Salvador. Now, in El Salvador, they don't call the uh, archbishop bad names. What they do is murder him. They do not uh, repre they do not censor the press. They wipe the press out. They sent the army in to blow up the church radio station. The editor of the independent newspaper was found in a ditch, mutilated, and, and cut to pieces with don't, machete. Don't, May I continue? I did well, not well, interrupt don't you. Don't you ever want to put they, a time value they, on anything you say? Excuse, or do you want that was nine, I'm, talk, I'm, talk, I'm talking about 19, I'm talking about 1980. You are a systematic I'm liar. Did these that, things happen or didn't they? Th these things did not happen in the context in which you suggested really? all. I, we, you we, are a phony, mister, and we, it's time that yeah. the people well, read you correctly. Uh, it's, it's clear, it's clear why you want to divert me from the discussion. That no, I, it's not. Yeah, it's no, because but let you me, just get tired of rubbish. Uh, uh, but let's You've continue given, with... Yeah, uh, ex sorry. Except we can't. I'm afraid we're out of time. We thank you both, John Silver and Noam Chomsky. Yeah, okay. Last time you were here, uh, you spoke about how when you go overseas you are given access to the mass media. But here that doesn't seem to be the case. Has that changed at all? Have you ever been invited to appear on uh, Nightline or Brinkley? Yes, I have a couple times been invited to speak on Nightline. I uh, couldn't do it. I had another talk and 
something or other. And to tell you the honest truth, I don't really care very much. FAIR, the media monitoring group, published a very interesting study of Nightline. It shows that their conception of a spectrum of opinion is ridiculously narrow, at least by European or world standards. Let me tell you a personal experience. I happened to be in Madison, Wisconsin, on a listener-supported radio station, community radio station, a very good one. I was having an interview with the news director. I've been on that program dozens of times, usually by telephone. And he's very good. He gets to all sorts of people. And he started the interview by playing for me a uh, tape of an interview that he had just had and had broadcast with the guy who's uh, some mucky muck in Nightline. I think his name is Jeff Greenfield or some such name. Does that name mean anything? I'm Jeff Greenfield for Nightline in New York. What about uh, just in the selection of guests to analyze things? Why is Noam Chomsky never on Nightline? I, I couldn't begin to tell you. He's one of the leading intellectuals in the entire world. Well, I have no idea. I mean, I can make some guesses. Uh, he may be one of the leading intellectuals who uh, can't talk on television. You know, that's a standard that's very important to us. If you've got a 22-minute show and a guy takes five minutes to warm up, now, I don't know whether Chomsky does or not. Uh, he's out. One of the reasons why Nightline has the usual suspects is one of the things you have to do when you book a show is know that the person can make the point within the framework of television. And if people don't like that, they should understand it is about as sensible to book somebody who will take eight minutes to give an answer as it is to book somebody who doesn't speak English. But in the normal give and flow, that's another culture bound thing. We've got to have English speaking people. We also need concision. So Greenfield, or whatever his name is, hit the nail on the head. The U.S. media are alone in that, that it is, you must meet the condition of concision. You got to say things between two commercials or in 600 words. And that's a very important fact because the beauty of concision, you know, saying a couple of sentences between two commercials, the beauty of that is that you can only repeat conventional thoughts. I was reading Chomsky 20 years ago. I think his notion, he, doesn't he have a, didn't he co-author a new book called Engineering Consent or The Manufacturing of Consent? Mm -hmm. I mean, some of that stuff to me looks like it's from Neptune. This is the first time the Neptune system has been seen clearly by human eyes. These pictures, taken only hours ago by Voyager 2, are its latest contribution. You know, he's perfectly entitled to say that I, I'm seeing it through a prism too. But my view of that, of, of his notions about the limits of debate in this country is absolutely wacko. Suppose I get up on Nightline, say, and I'm given whatever it is, two minutes, and I say, Gaddafi's a terrorist, Khomeini's a murderer, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Russians, you know, invaded Afghanistan, all this sort of stuff. I don't need any evidence. Everybody just nods. On the other hand, suppose you say something that just isn't regurgitating conventional pieties. Suppose you say something that's the least bit unexpected or controversial. Suppose you say... I mean, the biggest international terror operations that are known are the ones that are run out of Washington. Or suppose you say... What happened in the 1980s is the U.S. government was driven underground. Suppose I say the United States is invading South Vietnam, as it was. The best political leaders are the ones who are lazy and corrupt. If uh, the Nuremberg laws were applied, uh, then every post-war American president would have been hanged. The Bible is one of probably the most genocidal book in our total canon. Education is a system of imposed ignorance. There's no more morality in world affairs fundamentally than there was in the time of Genghis Khan. They're just different, you know, they're just different factors to be concerned with. Now, Jeff, see, thank you. Well, you know, people will reason quite reasonably expect to know what you mean. Why did you say that? I never heard that before. Uh, if you said that, you better have a reason, you know, you better have some evidence. In fact, you better have a lot of evidence because that's a pretty startling comment. Uh, you can't give evidence if you're stuck with concision. You know? That's the genius of, these, of this structural constraint. And in my view, if people like, say, Nightline and McNeil Lehrer and so on were smarter, if they were better propagandists, they would let dissidents on, let them on more, in fact. The reason is that they would sound like they're from Neptune. Then comes our special conversation on the Middle East crisis. Tonight's is with the activist, writer, and professor Noam Chomsky. 
I Again, do. there is has been an offer on the table, which we rejected, an Iraqi offer last April, okay. to, uh, to uh, uh, eliminate their chemical and other unconventional arsenals if Israel were to simultaneously do the same. Have to we end it there. It, but I think that should be pursued as well. Sorry to interrupt you. I have to end it there. That's the end of our time. Professor Chomsky, thank you very much for joining us. AT&T has supported the McNeil Era News Hour since 1983 because quality information and quality communications is our idea of a good connection. AT&T, the right choice. Oh, okay. okay. If you just did, can you just did for half, half a second? It's just yeah. for two shots, that's all, and we can do everything else. Right. Okay. It, yeah, what about the, uh, well, I better the mic? Is I, I, better look. Mark. I think there's some okay. stuff hanging around there. Right, the idea of this one is it's just a shot where I'm seen talking to you and you're seen listening to me. I'll ask you, though, if you don't speak to me or move your lips so that I can be seen to be asking you a question. The reason for the shot is simply this. I'm used to it. Okay, <laughs> just don't talk to me and I'll keep going. That's the thing. Uh, the reason for the shot, I'll explain it through because I usually find that's the easiest way to do it. The reason for the shot is I need a shot where you're sitting and seen listening to me while I'm asking you a question. We can use the shot to introduce you, explain who you are, where you fit into the piece I'm doing. But if you don't speak to me, I can also use... Got it? Okay. Thanks for your time. Right on. If there is a narrow range of opinion in the United States, and it is harder to express a, a variety of, of different opinions, why do you live in the U.S.? Well, I think it's, well, first of all, it's my country, and secondly, it's in many ways, I, as I said before, it's the freest country in the world. I mean, I think there's more possibilities for change here than in any other country I know. But again, comparatively speaking, it's the country where the state is probably most restricted. But isn't that what you should be looking at comparatively rather yes, than in I absolute do. terms? But of you course. don't, you don't do. treat on that con impression. On the well, maybe I don't give the impression. I certainly say it often enough. What I've said over and over again, and I've been saying it all tonight, I've written it a million times, is that the United States is a very free society. Uh, it's also a very rich society. Of course, the United States is a scandal from the point of view of its wealth. I mean, given the natural advantages that the United States has in terms of resources and uh, lack of enemies and so on, the United States should have a level of health and welfare and so on that's, you know, an order of magnitude beyond anybody else in the world. We don't. The United States is last among 20 industrialized societies in infant mortality. That's a scandal of American capitalism. And it ends up being a very free society, which does a lot of rotten things in the world. Okay? There's no contradiction there. I mean, you know, Greece was a free society by the standards of that, of Athens, you know. It's also a vicious society from the point of view of its imperial behavior. There's virtually no correlation between the, int, maybe none, between the internal freedom of a society and its external behavior. Uh, you, you, you start your line of discussion at a moment that is historically useful for you. you that's the I say, grand you pick the, you pick the beginning. of you the post-war world right. is that the communist, communist imperialists, by the use of terrorism, by the use of by the deprivation of freedom, uh, have contributed to the continuing bloodshed. And the sad thing about it is not only the bloodshed, but the fact that they seem to dispossess you of the power of rational right. observation. May I say something? Sure. Yeah. I think that's about 5% true, mm -hmm. and about, or maybe 10% true. It certainly is true. Why do you give that? Uh, may I complete a sentence? Sure. I mean, it's, it's perfectly true that there were areas of the world, in particular Eastern Europe, where, uh, where Stalinist imperialism uh, uh, very brutally uh, took control and still maintains control. But there are also very vast areas of the world where we were doing the same thing. And uh, there's quite an interplay in the Cold War. You see, the, what you just described is a, I believe, a mythology about the Cold War, which might have been tenable 10 years ago, but which is quite inconsistent with contemporary scholarship. Ask a Czech. Ask, ask a Guatemalan, ask a Dominican, uh, ask a person from the Dominican Republic, ask, you know, ask a, you uh, don't, ask you, a person from well, South Vietnam, you know, ask yeah, a Thai. Well, well, obviously, we can't get away. If you can't distinguish between the nature of our uh, venture in Guatemala and the nature of the Soviet Union's in Prague, What's the then difference? we have real well, difficulty. Explain, explain the difference. Sorry. Uh, now, what about making the media more responsive and democratic? Well, there are very narrow limits to that. It's kind of like asking, how do we make corporations more democratic? Well, the only way to do that is get rid of them, you know? I mean, if, if you have concentrated power, you can, I mean, I don't want to say you can do nothing. Like you can, you know, like the church can show up at the stockholders meeting and start screaming about not investing in South Africa. And sometimes that has marginal effects. I don't want to say it has no effects. But you can't really affect the structure of power because if you, I mean, to do that would be a social revolution. And unless you're ready for a social revolution, that is, power is going to be somewhere else, 
uh, the media are going to have their present structure and they're going to represent their present interests. Now, that's not to say that one shouldn't try to do things. I mean, it makes sense to try to push the limits of a system. It only takes one or two people that think they have integrity as journalists to give yeah. you some good press. See, that's important, and that goes back to something that came up before. I mean, there's a lot, you know, there are contradictions. You know, things are, con are complex. It's not monolithic. I mean, the mass media themselves are complicated institutions with internal contradictions. So on the one hand, there's the commitment to indoctrination and control. But on the other hand, there's the sense of professional integrity. She works alone as her own boss, writing newspaper columns and producing radio commentaries for a hodgepodge of small clients across the country. This so-called leather lung Texan has been firing questions at our chief executive for almost 40 years. And many a young man in this country is being disillusioned totally by his government these days. Well, this is a question which you very properly bring to the attention of the nation. It's not that we haven't been holding press conferences. I was just waiting for Sarah to come back. Mr. President, that's very nice of you, and I appreciate it. Sarah, I want to call your attention to a real problem we've got in this country today. Those unique and often terrifying McClendon questions reflect her desire to dig out information. And I want to ask your new man what he feels <laughs> With enough know-how and persistence, she usually gets her man. What would you do if you were in a situation where you were trying to be an honest reporter and you were worried sick about your country and you saw how sick it was and uh, you were facing this weak White House and a weak Congress uh, as a reporter, what would you do? I think there are a lot of reporters who do a very good job. In fact, I have a lot of friends in the press who I think do a terrific job. What well, you'd... I, I know they are. Well, you got you have to first. First, I mean, first of all, you have to understand what the system is, and smart reporters do understand what it is. You have to understand what the pressures are, what the commitments are, what the barriers are, and what the openings are. Like right after the Iran Contra hearings, a lot of good reporters understood. Well, things are going to be a little more open for a couple of months, so they could ram through stories that they knew they couldn't even talk about before. After Watergate. Uh, and, and the same after Watergate. And then, you know, it closes up again and so on. Most people, I imagine, simply internalize the values. Uh, that's the easiest way and the most successful way. You just internalize the values and then you regard yourself in a way correctly as uh, acting perfectly freely. All right, let's get to the White House now where I think veteran uh, correspondent uh, Frank Sesno could tell us a little bit about self-censorship. That, that, that uh, inertial guidance system is always going on, isn't it? Is there any formal censorship there? Well, there's no self-censorship, uh, Reed. If somebody tells me something, I'm going to pass it on unless there's a particular and compelling reason not to. I can't deny that I wouldn't like to have access to the Oval Office and all the same maps and charts and graphs that the President's looking at, but that's not possible, it's not realistic, and it's probably not even desirable. Hello. How are you? Fine. Can I sit down there, please? Yes. Welcome to Holland. Ik, uh, I'll introduce you first in a few lines. Uh, Professor Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, is nu zes en is ongeveer de meest uh, controversiële intellectueel van Amerika. Dat is ook alweer een platitude, maar zo wordt hij nu eenmaal altijd genoemd. Chomsky has been called the Einstein of modern linguistics. The New York Times has said he's arguably the most important intellectual alive today. But his presence here has sparked a protest. This book that has, has poisoned the world, an old liar in there. And as a Vietnamese people, we come here to warn the book. Vietnam! Vietnam! He said that in Vietnam there's no violation of human rights and no crime in Cambodia is wrong. Chomsky is using, he's a professor, he using that to poison the world. And we, we come here to protest that. I don't mind the denunciations, frankly. I mind the lies. I mean, intellectuals are very good at lying. They're professionals at it. You know, wonderful technique. There's no way of responding to it. If somebody calls you, a, you know, an anti-Semite, what can you say? I'm not an anti-Semite. You know, somebody says you're, you're a racist, you're a Nazi or something. There's, you always lose. I mean, the person who throws the mud always wins yeah. because there's no way of responding to such charges. Professor Chomsky seems to believe that the people he criticizes fall into one of two classes, liars or dupes. Consider what happens when I discuss the case of Robert Faurisson. Let me recall the facts. Uh, let's not go into details, please, because do the we details can't... happen to be important. Yes, but I have only one question on the Faurisson question. Do the facts matter or don't they matter? 
Uh, of course it is. Well, let me yeah. tell you what the facts are. Uh -huh. Faisal says that the, that the massacre of the Jews in the Holocaust is a historic lie. No. No, this is, an, this is an important one. It has a lot to do with the topic. Your views are extremely controversial, and perhaps one of the one of the things that has been most controversial and you've been most strongly criticized for was your defense of a, a French intellectual who was suspended from his university post for contending that there were no Nazi death camps in World War II. My name is Robert Forisson. I am 60. I am university professor in Lyon, France. Behind me, you may see the courthouse of Paris the Palais de Justice. In this place, I was convicted many times at the beginning of the 80s. I was charged by nine associations, mostly Jewish associations, for uh, inciting hatred, racial hatred, for racial defamation, for damage by falsifying a story. Professor Chomsky and a number of other intellectuals signed a petition in which Fourisson is called a respected professor of literature who merely tried to make his findings public. Perhaps we can start with just the story of uh, Robert Fourisson and uh, your involvement. More than 500 people signed, maybe 600, uh, mostly uh, universitaires, uh, scholars. And what happened to the other 499 of them? How come we only hear about Chomsky's signature? Well, I think it's because Chomsky is in himself a kind of political power. I signed a petition calling on the tribunal to defend his civil rights. At that point, the French press, which apparently has no conception of freedom of speech, uh, concluded that since I had called for his civil rights, I was therefore defending his theses. Fourisson then published a book in which he tried to prove that the Nazi gas chambers never existed. What we deny is that there was an extermination program and an extermination, actually, especially in gas chambers or gas vans. The book contains a preface written by Professor Chomsky in which he calls Fourisson a relatively apolitical sort of liberal. A communist is a man, a Jew is a man, a Nazi is a man, I am a man. Are you a Nazi? I am not a Nazi. How would you describe yourself politically? Nothing. The preface that you have wrote, whether no, you no, that's, it. that's not the preface that I wrote because I never wrote a preface. You and did? you know that I never wrote a preface. Yeah, we have to be done uh, He's referring to a statement of mine on civil liberties, which was added to a book in which Florissant, excuse me. Yes, I and use the sir. language you use has meaning. That's right. And, and, the, and the language I use. Any political liberal, or li as someone whose views can be dignified by the word findings or conclusions, that is a judgment, and that is a favorable judgment of oh, his views. Oh, on the contrary. Can I continue with the fact? There yes, are, you can continue with the facts for hours, but, but, but I mean, but, but there, there are, are few facts that, yeah, okay. Let's get to the so-called yeah. preface. Huh? Uh, I was then asked by the person who organized the petition yeah. to write a statement on freedom of speech, yeah. just banal comments uh -huh. about freedom of speech, pointing out the difference between uh -huh. defending a person's right to express his views and defending the views expressed. So I did that. I wrote a rather banal statement called Some Elementary Remarks on Freedom of Expression. Mm -hmm. uh, and I told him, do what you like with it. So uh, Pierre produced a book which all the arguments of Florisson were to be put in front of the court. And we thought uh, wise uh, to use the text of Noam Chomsky as a kind of warning, a foreword, uh, to say that it was a matter of freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of research. Why did you try at the last moment to get it back from That's the book? That's the one thing I'm sorry about. 
But that's the, the real, that's the no, real it's important not. thing. It's not. Of course. You mean the fact you, that I tried to retract because it? Because with that you said it was wrong of no, you I to didn't. do it. No, I didn't. See, in fact, take a look at what I, I, I wrote a letter, which was mm. then publicized, in which I said, look, things have reached the point mm. where the French intellectual community simply is incapable of understanding the issues. Mm -hmm. At this point, it's just going to confuse matters even more if my uh, comments on freedom of speech happen to be attached to this book, which I don't, didn't know existed. So just to clarify things, you better separate them. Now, in retrospect, I think I probably shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. I should have just said, fine, then let it appear, because it ought to appear. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, apart from that, uh, I regard this as not only trivial, but as compared with other positions I've taken on freedom of speech, invisible. I do not think that the state ought to have the right to determine historical truth and to punish people who deviate from it. I'm not willing to give the state that right, even if they happen to But are you denying truth. that the gas chambers ever First existed? Not. But I'm saying, if you believe in freedom of speech, you believe in freedom of speech for views you don't like. I mean, Goebbels was in favor of freedom of speech for views he liked, right? So was Stalin. If you're in favor of freedom of speech, that means you're in favor of freedom of speech precisely for views you despise. Otherwise, you're not in favor of freedom of speech. There's two positions you can have on freedom of speech. Now, you can decide which position you want. With regard to my defense of the utterly offensive, the, the, the people who express utterly offensive views, I have the slightest doubt that every commissar says, you're defending that person's views. No, I'm not. I'm defending his right to express them. The difference is crucial, and the difference has been understood outside of fascist circles since the 18th century. Is there anything like objectivity, or yeah. scientific objectivity, reality, as a scientist? Yeah, look, I'm not saying I defend the views. I, look, if, if, if somebody publishes a scientific article, which I disagree with, I do not say the state ought to put him in jail. Right? All right, but you don't have to support him right away and say, you know, him. I support no. him just oh, no. for the sake of yeah, everybody but, saying that, fine. you know, whatever suppose, he wants to say. But suppose this guy is taken to court and charged with falsification then I'm going to defend them, even right. if I disagree. But he was taken happened. to court. Oh, you're wrong. But, they, but when did you write the support? I mean, did when you he was brought to court. And in fact, the only support that I gave him is to say he has a right of freedom of speech, period. There is no doubt in my mind that the example that I gave about the story is the Holocaust did not exist is very, very typical. Uh, how, how much I'll give you another the, example about how the How much of the American press believes the that Florissant has anything to say, or uh -huh. any press? How much of the press in France? Since I follow, what percentage since, would you say? I'll tell you. Is, it, is I, it higher than zero? I don't know. I'll tell is it higher you, I'll than tell zero? You, I'll tell you. Have you ever seen anything in any newspaper me, or I'll, any journal I'll try to saying answer. that this man is anything other than okay. a lunatic? I'll try to answer. Okay. I'll try to answer. I think that uh, I just follow the That's case. That's a simple question. I followed the case five or six years ago, and mm -hmm. I happened to see that uh, Noam Chomsky was in for strong criticism, even from some of his supporters, for doing something which could be interpreted only in terms of a campaign against Israel. Going back years, I am absolutely certain that I've taken far more extreme positions on people who deny the Holocaust than you have. For example, you go back to my earliest articles and you will find that I say that even to enter into the arena of debate on the question of whether the Nazis carried out such atrocities is already to lose one's humanity. So I don't even think you ought to discuss the issue if you want to know my opinion. But if anybody wants to refute Faurisson, there's certainly no difficulty in doing so. I'm not interested in, in uh, freedom of speech and all that. I have to win, and that's the question. And I shall win. I'm, I'm just an ordinary mom who just thinks in terms of I don't want to someday be holding my grandchildren and watching something horrible happen and feel like I didn't do anything. And I mean, it's obvious what, what you're doing. And my question is, on a practical level, where do you see the most practical place 
to put your energy. I mean, tonight I feel in overwhelm, like I feel like it's too big, it's too much to, to even make a dent in. The way things change is because lots of people are working all the time. And, you know, they're working in their communities, in their workplace, or wherever they happen to be, and they're building up the basis for popular movements which are going to make changes. That's the way everything has ever happened in history, you know, whether it was the end of slavery or uh, whether it was uh, the democratic revolutions or anything you want, you name it, that's the way it worked. Uh, you get a very false picture of this from the history books. In the history books, there's a couple of leaders, uh, you know, George Washington or Martin Luther King or whatever. And I don't want to say that those people are unimportant, like Martin Luther King was certainly important, but he was not the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King can appear in the history books because lots of people whose names you will never know and whose names are all forgotten and who may have been killed and so on were working down in the South. When you have uh, active activists and people concerned and people devoting themselves and dedicating themselves to social change or issues or whatever, then uh, people like me can appear and we can appear to be prominent, but that's only because somebody else is doing the work. My work, uh, whether it's uh, giving hundreds of talks a year or spending 20 hours a week writing letters or writing books, is not directed to uh, uh, intellectuals and politicians. It's directed to what are called ordinary people. Yeah. Uh, and what I uh, expect from them is, in fact, exactly what they are, that they should uh, try to understand the world and act in accordance with their decent impulses uh, and that they should try to improve the world and many people are willing to do that but they have to understand and in fact as far as I can see in, in these things cool. I feel that I'm simply helping people develop the courses of intellectual self-defense. What did you mean by that? What, what would such a course well, be? I don't mean go to school because you're not going to get it there. Uh, it means uh, you have to develop an independent mind and work on it. Now, that's extremely hard to do alone. You know? the, the beauty of our system is it isolates everybody. Each person is sitting alone in front of the two. You know? now, it's very hard to have ideas or thoughts under those circumstances. You can't fight the world alone. You know? uh, some people can, but it's pretty rare. The way to do it is through organization. So courses of intellectual self-defense will have to be in the context of political and other organization. And it makes sense, I think, to look at what the institutions are trying to do and to take that almost as a key. What they're trying to do is what we're trying to combat. If they're trying to keep people isolated and separate and, uh, you know, uh, and so on, well, we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to bring them together. So in your local community, you want to have uh, sources of alternative action. People with parallel concerns, maybe differently focused, but at the core, sort of similar values and a similar interest in helping people learn how to defend themselves against external power and taking control of their lives and, you know, reaching out your hand to people who need it. That's a common array of concerns. You can learn about your own values and you can figure out how to defend yourself and so on in conjunction with others. Um. Are there one or two publications that I, as an average person, a biologist, can read to bypass this filter of our, par of our press? Now, if you ask what media can I turn to to get the right answers, first of all, I wouldn't tell you that because I don't think there's an answer. The right answers are what you decide are the right answers. Maybe everything I'm telling is wrong, okay? Could perfectly well be, I'm the God. But that's something for you to figure out. I mean, I could tell you what I think happens to be more or less right, but there isn't any reason why you should pay any attention to it. What impact do you feel alternative media is currently having or could potentially have? I'm actually a little more interested in its potential. potential. And uh, just to define my terms, by alternative media I'm referring to media that are or could be citizen controlled as opposed right. to state or corporate right. control. Right. You know, that's what's kept people together. To the extent that people are able to do something constructive, it's because they have some way of interacting. I mean, I've always felt it would be a very positive thing, and it should be pushed as far as it can go. Uh, I think it's going to have a very hard time. Uh, there's just such a concentration of resources and power that uh, uh, alternative media, while extremely important, are uh, going to have quite a battle. It's true there are things which are small successes, but it's because people have just been 
are willing to put in incredible effort. Like say, take Z Magazine. I mean, that's a national magazine which literally has a staff of two and no resources. Tell us a little about Z Magazine, what it is and what makes it different. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. We just wanted to do a magazine that would address all the sides of political life, economics, race, gender, authority, political relations. And we wanted to do it in a way that would incorporate an attention to how to not only understand what's going on, but how to make things better, what to aim toward, and uh, to provide, at the same time, humor, culture, a kind of a magazine that people could relate to and could get a lot out of and could participate in. And what we wanted to do, which we didn't think was provided by the existing magazines, was to give it a real activist slant so that it could be very useful to the variety of uh, movements in the country. And we just felt there wasn't a magazine that reflected that, that inspired people and that gave people sort of a, a strategy and perhaps even a vision of how things could be better. South End Press has sort of made it. Now that is, they're surviving. It's a small collective, again, with no resources, and they put out a lot of books, including quite a lot of good books. But for a South End book to get reviewed is almost impossible. Editorially and um, business-wise, we make decisions based on um, a politics that no corporate publisher can really um, advocate because of their ties to corporate America. We can solicit manuscripts based on what we feel is the relevance for the movement. And we can make our business decisions based on whether we feel people can afford our books, whether we feel that a book uh, might not make that much money, but it needs to be out there, and maybe there is a thousand people who would buy it. And those are criteria that we feel are very precious in this day of, of corporate mergers. Well, and likewise, our structure about sharing work and continuing our training process as long as we're at the press, there are losses there in terms of productivity. But in terms of empowerment, all of us are then able to say, my perspective is different from yours. Then all of our intelligence gets used in making those decisions and not just whoever happens to have done it the longest, whoever happens to uh, have graduated from the best schools in order to be the best editor, making all the decisions and only using his or her intelligence. Well, so supporting radio in the United States has undergone a remarkable growth in the last decade. Uh, it's perhaps the fastest growing alternative media. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Uh, first and foremost is that it's enormously economical and it reaches communities that have not been served by community radio before. And in bold in particular, we see with someone like uh, Noam Chomsky, who's been there, I believe, three times in the last six years, uh, he has a tremendous audience. And KGNU is partly responsible for that because we play his tapes on a regular ba basis. We play his lectures and his interviews. So when he does come to Boulder and people hear what he has to say, they're able to tune in. It's not something exotic or esoteric that he's talking about. It's material that they're very familiar with. And he's noted this, incidentally. I mean, if there's a listener-supported radio station, you're, that means that people can get daily, every day, a different way of looking at the world, not just what the corporate media want you to see, but a different picture, a different understanding. Not only can you hear it, but you can participate in it. You can add your own thoughts, you know, and you can learn something and so on. Well, that's the way uh, people become uh, human, you know. That's the way you become human participants in a in a social and political system. Hello, I'm Ed Robinson, and this is Non-Corporate News. What is Non-Corporate News, and why is it necessary? I didn't want to just show another film at a library or something. I wanted to make my own statement. I thought it would be more fun to do, and perhaps I could get other people involved in a, in a project besides showing a film. We could, we could make a film or a video. The local cable stations hooked up to three communities, Lynn, Swampscott, and Salem. So that's 30,000 people, it, or 30,000 homes, I'm not sure, but I'm sure a lot of people will see it, and it'll be the kind of people who don't go out to, to see a film. 
it'll go right into their houses. So if they're flipping through the channels, they might be able to get a completely new idea of the world. So there's kind of networks of cooperation developed, which, I mean, like here, for example, is a collection of stuff from a friend of mine in Los Angeles who uh, does careful monitoring of the whole press in Los Angeles and a lot of the British press, which he reads, uh, and sele does selection, so I don't have to read the, you know, the movie reviews and the local gossip and all this kind of stuff, but I get the occasional nugget that sneaks through and that you find if you're carefully and intelligently and critically reviewing a wide range of press. Well, there are a fair number of people who do this, and we exchange information. We wrote this a two-volume work in which we saw one another for a couple of weeks when we were getting started, but then we wrote two volumes essentially without seeing one another, just uh, by phone, by, by mail, and uh, exchanging manuscripts. And, but this takes a lot of, a lot of uh, communication by mail. My, my Chomsky file is a couple of feet thick. The end result is that you do have access to resources in a way which I doubt that any national intelligence agency can duplicate, a little on scholarship. So there are ways of compensating for the uh, absence of resources. People can do things. Like, for example, I found out about the arms flow to Iran by reading transcripts of the BBC. Uh, and by reading uh, an interview somewhere with an Israeli ambassador in one city and reading something else in the Israeli press. Now, okay, the information is there, but it's there to a fanatic, you know, somebody who wants to uh, spend a substantial part of their time and energy exploring it and comparing today's lies with yesterday's leaks and so on. That's a research mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it just simply doesn't make any sense to ask the uh, general population to dedicate themselves to this task on every issue. I'm not given the false modesty. There are mm. things that I can do, and I mm. know that I can do them reasonably well, uh, including uh, uh, analysis mm. and uh, you know, uh, uh, study, research. I mean, I know how to do that sort yeah. of thing, and I think I have a reasonable understanding of the way the world uh, works as much as anyone can. Yeah. And that turns out to be a very useful resource for people who are uh, uh, who are doing active organizing, uh, 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 trying to uh, engage themselves in a way which will make it a little bit of a better world. Uh, and if you can help in those things or mm. participate in them, well, that's, uh, you know, that's rewarding. I wonder if you can envision a time when people uh, like myself, uh, again, the naive people of this world, can again take pride in the United States. And is that even a healthy wish now? Because it may be this hunger uh, for pride in our country that makes us more easily manipulated by the powers that you talk about. Uh, I think you first of all have to ask what you mean by your country. Now, if you mean by the country, the government, I don't think you can be proud of it, and I don't think you could ever be proud of it. Or it couldn't be proud of any government. It's not our government. You know. uh, and you shouldn't be. States are violent institutions. They, the government of any country, including ours, represents some sort of domestic power structure, and it's usually violent. States are violent to the extent that they're powerful. That's roughly accurate. You look at American history, it's nothing to write home about. You know, why are we here? We're here because, say, some 10 million Native Americans were wiped out. That's not very pretty. Until the 1960s, it was still cowboys and Indians. In the 1970s, for the first time, really, it became possible even for scholarship to try to deal with the facts as they were. For example, to deal with the fact that the Native American population was far higher than had been claimed, millions higher, maybe as many as 10 million higher than had been claimed, and that they had an advanced civilization, and that there was something akin to genocide that took place. Now, we went through 200 years of our history without facing that fact. Uh, one of the effects of the 1960s is it's possible to at least begin to come to, to think about the facts. Well, that's an advance. Do you think that this activism 20 years ago has made a, a difference in how our society operates now? Uh, it has not changed the institutions and the way they function. But it has led to very significant cultural changes. Uh, remember these movements of the 60s, uh, 
expanded in the 70s and expanded further in the 80s, and they reached into other parts of the society and different issues. Uh, these uh, a, a lot of things that seemed uh, outrageous in the 60s are taken for granted today. Uh, so, for example, take the feminist movement, for example, which barely began to exist in the 60s. Now it's part of general consciousness and awareness. Uh, the uh, ecological movements began in the 70s. Uh, the solidarity, mo third world solidarity movements were very limited in the 60s. It was really Vietnam. Uh, and uh, in the 60s also it was a student movement, as you say. Now it's not. Now it's mainstream America. If there is more dissidence now than you can remember, why do you go on to write that the people feel isolated? Because I think much of the general population recognizes that the organized institutions do not reflect their concerns and interests and needs. They do not feel that they participate meaningfully in the political system. They do not feel that the media are telling them the truth or even reflect their concerns. Uh, they go outside of the organized institutions to act. We see more and more of our elected leaders and know less and less of what they're doing. Yeah. In fact, this medium it, does that. Very striking. In fact, the, the presidential elections have been almost removed from the point where the public even takes them seriously as involving a matter of choice. So what do you think about what goes on in the White House? It's kept too <laughs> private, I think. Yeah, they should come out. Talk I know. People. Yeah. Who should talk to the people? Yeah. George, George Bush. Bush. <laughs> Well, it means that the political system increasingly, increasingly functions without public input. Uh, it means to an increasing extent, not only do people not ratify decisions presented to them, but they don't even take the trouble of ratifying them. They assume that the decisions are going on independently of what they may do in the polling booth. Ratification would, have, would be what? Well, ratification would mean a system in which there are two positions presented to me, the voter, I go into the polling booth and I push one or another button depending on which of those positions I want. That's a very limited form of democracy. Really meaningful democracy would mean that I play a role in forming those decisions and making and creating those positions. And that would be real democracy. That's not we're happening. very far from that. But we're even departing from the point where there is ratification. When you have stage managed elections uh, with the public relations industry determining what words come out of people's mouth candidates decide what to say on the basis of tests that determine what the effect will be across the population. Somehow people don't see how profoundly contemptuous that is of democracy. The solemn moment is near, but first, the swearing in of Van Quayle. Please move to your seats. For the first time in this century, for the first time in perhaps all history, man does not have to invent a system by which to live. We don't have to talk late into the night about which form of government is better. We don't have to wrest justice from the king. We only have to summon it from within ourselves. This is a time when the future sees a door you can walk right through into a room called tomorrow. Great nations of the world are moving toward democracy through the door to freedom. People agitate for free expression and free thought. There are no moral and intellectual satisfaction. We know how to secure a more just and prosperous life for men on earth. and the exercise of and free the will shall. unhampered by the state. I've spoken of a thousand points of light, of all the community organizations that are spread like stars throughout the nation doing good. To the world, too, we offer new engagement and a renewed vow. We will stay strong to protect the peace the offered hand, the reluctant fist. America can never wholly herself unless she is engaged in high moral principles. We as a people have such a purpose today. It is to make kinder the face of the nation and 
gentler in the face of the world. Referring back to your earlier comment about uh, escaping from or doing away with capitalism, I was wondering what scheme, workable scheme, you would put in its place. Me? Or uh, well, what I would, <laughs> yeah. what, well, what you would know, you I, suggest to others who might be in a position yeah. to set it up and get it going? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, what used to be called centuries ago wage slavery is intolerable. I mean, I don't think people ought to be forced to rent themselves in order to survive. I think that the economic institutions ought to be run democratically by their participants, by the communities in which they exist, and so on. And uh, I think basically through various kinds of free association. Historically, have there been any uh, sustained examples on any substantial scale of uh, societies which approximated to the anarchist ideal? There are small societies, uh, small in number, that have, I think, done so quite well. And there are a few examples of large-scale uh, libertarian revolutions, which were largely anarchist in their structure. Uh, as to the first, small societies ex extending over a long period, I myself think the most dramatic example is uh, perhaps the Israeli kibbutzim, uh, which for a long period, may or may not be true today, really were constructed on anarchist principles, that is, of direct worker control, integration of agriculture, industry, service, personal life on an egalitarian basis with direct and in fact quite active participation in self-management and were, I should think, extraordinarily successful. A good example of a really large-scale anarchist revolution or largely anarchist revolution, in fact the best example to my knowledge is the Spanish Revolution in 1936 and in fact uh, you can't tell what would have happened. That anarchist revolution was simply destroyed by force, but during the period in which it was alive, I think it was uh, inspiring testimony to the ability of uh, poor working people to uh, organize, manage uh, their affairs extremely successfully without coercion and control. How far does the success of uh, libertarian socialism or anarchism as a way of life really depend on a fundamental change in the nature uh, of man, both in his motivation, his altruism, and also in his knowledge and sophistication. I think it not only depends on it, but in fact, the whole purpose of libertarian socialism is that it will contribute to it. Uh, it will contribute to a spiritual transformation, precisely that kind of great transformation in, uh, in the way humans conceive of themselves and their uh, ability to act to decide, to create, to produce, to inquire, precisely that spiritual transformation that uh, social thinkers from the left Marxist tradition, from Lex Luxembourg, say, on over through anarcho-syndicalists have always emphasized. So on the one hand, it requires that spiritual transformation. On the other hand, the, its purpose is to create institutions which will contribute to that transformation. You've written that in looking at contributions of gifted thinkers, one must make sure to understand their contributions, but also to eliminate the errors in them. Um, and of your ideas, what would you guess would be discarded and what would be assimilated by future thinkers? Well, I mean, I would assume virtually everything would be discarded. Uh, for example, in, uh, here, here we have to distinguish. I mean, the work that I do in my professional area I mean, if I still believed what I believed 10 years ago, I'd assume the field is dead. Uh, so I assume that when next time you read a student's paper, you're going to see something that has to be changed and you continue to make progress. In dealing with social and political issues, in my view, what is at all understood is pretty straightforward. I don't think that there, there may be deep and complicated things, but if so, they're not understood. Uh, the uh, uh, the basic ways, to the extent that we understand society at all, it's pretty straightforward. And I don't think that those simple understandings are likely to undergo much change. Uh, the point is that you have to work. And that's why, that's why the propaganda system is so successful. Uh, very few people are going to have the time or the energy or the commitment to carry out the constant battle that's required to get outside of the, uh, you know, McNeil era or Dan Rather or somebody like that, the easy thing to do, you know, you come home from work, you're tired, you've had a busy day, you know, you're not going to spend the evening carrying out a research project, so you turn on the tube and say it's probably right, you know, 
or you look at the headlines in the paper and then you watch the sports or something. Because uh, and, and that's that's basically the way the system of indoctrination works. Sure, the other stuff is there, but you're going to have to work to find it. Modern industrial civilization has developed within a certain system of convenient myths. The driving force of modern industrial civilization has been individual material gain, uh, which is accepted as legitimate, uh, even praiseworthy, on the grounds that uh, private vices yield public benefits in the classic formulation. Now, it's long been understood very well that a society is, that is based on this principle will destroy itself in time. It can only persist with whatever suffering and injustice it entails as long as it's possible to pretend uh, that the destructive forces that humans create are limited, uh, that the world is an infinite resource and that the world is an infinite garbage can. At this stage of history, either one of two things is possible. Either the general population will take control of its own destiny and will concern itself with community interests guided by values of solidarity and sympathy and concern for others, or alternatively, there will be no destiny for anyone to control. As long as some specialized class is in a position of authority, it is going to set policy in the special interests that it serves. But the conditions of survival, let alone justice, require rational social planning in the interests of the community as a whole, and by now that means the global community. The question is whether privileged elites should dominate mass communication and should use this power as they tell us they must, namely to impose necessary illusions, to manipulate and deceive the stupid majority and remove them from the public arena. The question in brief is whether democracy and freedom are values to be preserved or threats to be avoided. In this possibly terminal phase of human existence, democracy and freedom are more than values to be treasured. They may well be essential to survival. Thank you. He's up there thinking for himself, and he's deciphering this tremendously overweighted body of information, which he puts into an order. And gives you the feeling that you can do the same thing, that the whole thing is decipherable. And he also gives you the sense that there is a source, there's a center to the, um, to a dissenting population, although we feel that there's no center. And I think that is what re reactivated in me um, a desire to get back get reacquainted with the political scene after 30 years of alienation from it. You do hundreds of interviews and lectures, and, um, and you're dealing with massacres in East Timor and, and uh, invasions of Panama, etc. Pretty horrific stuff, death squads. What keeps you going? I mean, don't you get burned out on this material? Uh, well, you know, it's mainly a matter of whether you can look yourself in the mirror, I think. Oh, gotta go. Get these three more in town. Okay. Maybe you can say all the four for us. Okay. Oh, yes, that's true, yeah. Who believe it? 
I'm sorry about making you answer that. No, that's okay. It's so short. It worked. <laughs> did we hit it in two minutes? Or? Well, we, we, we did pretty well. Actually, yeah. that means less sports, and that's fine okay. to me. People out there, they don't know what's going on. If the people knew what you say here today, there'd be a, a heck of a change. Thank you. On that optimistic note, Professor Chomsky, thank you very much indeed. So how did it go? Oh, I thought it was sort of sort of technical sounding. But um you know, there was there wasn't much of a, a rhythm. Did you ever think for, of running for president? <laughs> if I ran for president, first thing I'd do is tell people not to vote for me. <laughs> this guy's got to go home. Still, he really does. Yeah. And people still, believe, people still believe that the Celtics lost in the world champion. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.